Hey, it's Tim back for Wrong Sports, and if you have checked out my other lists or documentaries, you may see that I love to talk about college sports, especially college football, and I especially love to talk about older or historical teams. I really love to talk about those teams that have done something wrong, though, or gotten in trouble for it, but I also like to talk about teams that we don't usually talk about. That is why if you have seen my list of the worst historical football teams or teams before World War II, you might know I like to go on a deep dive of things. That is why I wanted to go on a deep dive today on really bad teams and programs you may have never heard of. This has taken me a while to piece together because finding historical football data from small schools is hard to find, but I think I have found some of the worst college football teams and programs you may have never heard about because these are some of the worst programs programs from Division 2 and Division 3. First up, let's start with McAllister College. Do you know where that's out of? That's out of Minnesota. They will be one of a few schools from the Midwest on this list, but this school comes up first for being known as the oldest loser. They held the longest losing streak in Division 3 football for over 30 years before it was broken by another team I will mention on this list. Uh, this team's losing streak lasted 50 straight games over six years and over three coaches. Here is some backstory about McAllister College, though. Uh, they are located in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, they do have a population, a school population, of over 2,000. And this school is pretty wealthy co compared to other Division Three schools as they do have an endowment of over $600 million. So this school is known more for their academics than their athletics. Clearly, you can see why, because they're on this list of worst teams. McAllister College Football, or the Scots, which is their nickname, they've been playing for football since World War I and really don't have much to show for it. They don't have any conference titles that I can find, and that means no national titles or really any huge accomplishments. They actually had a long football losing streak in the mid-60s and had three straight winless seasons from 1963 to 1965. They started to get respectable towards the later part of the 60s, but that would only get them ready for their most infamous streak. Okay, so all of their trouble really started in December 1971 with their previous coach, Dick Borstand, resigning. McAllister was looking to fill the role and went and hired their top assistant, Don Hudson. When hiring Hudson, McAllister went with the comfort as he was an assistant at McAllister the previous year and also coached a few years at the high school level in Minneapolis, so he knew the area. This hiring was also very significant because Don Hudson was an African American, making him and McAllister the first school ever to hire an African American as a head football coach of a college football team. This was one year before Portland State did it and eight years before Wichita State did it, which they get a lot of the credit for because they did it in 1979, and they did it at the Division I level. McAllister and Hudson weren't big news with this hiring in the big city of Minneapolis-St. Paul because the school wasn't good at football, and no one seemed to care, and no one showed up for their games anyway. Hudson had a hard time in St. Paul as the school was known as the Harvard of the Midwest, and he was an African American trying to recruit players that could get into this prestigious school. He would start his tenure with the school going winless, but then he won one game in 1973, and then next season, his win total would grow to two wins in 1974, but then the bottom fell out once again in 1975, and they won 0-10. Hudson resigned to go back to coaching his alma mater, but that didn't matter, as the streak had its talons in this team, and it wasn't going to let go. Their losing streak continued with a new coach in Clint Ewald. He was only 33 when he took the job. He was a former Minnesota high school coach. He came to McAllister in 1976 in April, and there were thoughts of dropping football altogether. But the coach fought and talked with the university into giving him a three-year period of grace, basically. And instead, the program would be on a trial period, and then after the three years, they would make a decision. However, the recruiting for the 1976 season and under Hudson in general were blamed, and this team only having 27 players on the team when they started, which means they had to start eight or nine on both offense or defense all game. And because of having pretty much no players all game, they went 0-8 in 1976. They would have their worst season, though, in 1977, as they set a Division Three record, and probably a record that won't be broken in Division One either, by allowing 59 points per game. And they went 0-7 with some losses, like a 97-6 to loss to the second-place team in their division. And they also got shut out at least twice, but they probably got shut out a few more times. That's really all of the uh, results that I could find. 
They went into their third and final trial season under Wald, but they were the same. They were very bad, but their defense only gave up 44 points per game, so I guess that's an improvement from the previous season, but they were also atrocious this season. They only scored 29 points, that's 3.1 points per game, along with 100 yards per game over 8 terrible losses. It would be looking up for them, though, towards the end of this decade, as in 1979, the school went in a different direction, they stayed with football, and they hired a new coach in Tom Hosier. He was a college coach from Eureka College, a small school in Illinois, and he came in with a bigger roster and some positive vibes as he built up Eureka's football program into a winner. The 1979 season, though, was very tough for him at McAllister as they went 0-8, but their defense got a little bit better. They were still really bad as they gave up 35 points per game, and again, the offense couldn't score as they only scored 6 points per game, but again, much better than previous seasons. Their losing streak finally ended in 1980 as they made a 23-yard field goal with 11 seconds left to give them their lead and their first win since 1974. And they would also get a tie in conference, giving them their first non-all-losing season in the conference since 1974. McAllister College eventually did get better under this new coach as he did coach them to three straight years with six wins, and he would actually win seven games and six in conference in 1986, and they were second in the conference that year. That was the first time they were that high in decades. All right, next up is a team that we have to go all the way up to New England for, and this is another team that had a very long losing streak, and 20 years later, they still aren't any better. This team is out of the New England Small College Athletic Conference, which is made up of schools that have no more than 2,000 students, and they put way more emphasis on Nobel Prize winners rather than football wins. This school is Bates College out of Maine. Bates is one of three colleges out of Maine in this conference, which they all play each other every year to find a champion of Maine. Bates is one of the more successful colleges in the Maine series overall, but for a time in the 1990s, Bates was one of the worst. Bates started the 1990s with a 1990 season of 2-6, and six, and this 2-6 and six record was the best it was going to get until the very end of the decade. The 1991 season didn't start with a loss as they had a 26-26 tie with Amherst, but then proceeded to lose their next seven games, ending 0-7-1, and they lost most games by an average of 18 points or more. They are now on a seven-game losing streak as they open up the 1992 season, and Bates and every team in their conference play only conference games, and all teams make up their rosters using players that are students. And since most of these schools are in the top 100 or 150 colleges in the country, it is isn't easy to get good talent on the field. You can get good talent in the classroom, but not on the field. And because of that, this losing streak continued into 1992, which was probably their worst year ever. They went 0-8 in 1992, and they were somehow worse than a year before, as they only averaged to score 38 points all season, letting up 355 yards, giving them an average loss of about 40 points each game, including losing to fellow main school and rival Colby College, 52 to nothing. 1993 was probably their second worst season, though, of this run, as they went 0-8 again. I know, shocking. But they did score a few more points this year, as they almost doubled their last year's scoring, as this year they scored 71 points, giving them an average points per game of a little more than 8. But they gave up over 300 points again, as they gave up 330 points. Their biggest loss this year was a 72-0 thumping by Trinity College out of Hartford, and a 50 plus point loss to Williams College where they fell behind 35 to nothing in the first quarter. Okay, we're not even halfway through this decade and you would think it's going to get better, right? No, it's not. Because in 1994, they only managed to score double digits in a few games where they averaged 10 points per game. But again, their defense was atrocious as they let up 300 plus points again, continuing their three season run of losing every game by an average of 40 points or more. The 1995 season came and everyone wondered when it was going to stop. Well, it didn't stop during their first six games at least, as Bates lost all of them. But when they started their main college football series, it got a little better for them, as they played Bowdoin College, which was another main rival of Bates. And Bates fought hard in their late 1995 matchup and fought to end up winning 33-29, to giving them their first win since their first game in 1991. And this was actually their first conference win this decade. 
guaranteed. Bates would then lose their next game, ending the season 1-7. and seven. Bates is still one of the bottom feeders of the NES CAC and have one winning record since the end of the losing streak as they went 5-3 and three in 2012 and had three seasons where they were only 500. This school's last winning record was back in 1981, so yeah, Bates definitely deserves to be on this list. Okay, next up, I'm going to bring you to Ohio, to where football was created, and also the home of two very bad football programs. First, let's start with the oldest loser out of this pair, Marietta College. Marietta College is known more for their baseball program, as they have won over 30 conference titles, but their football program has none. I would also like to add that Marietta College plays in the Ohio Athletic Conference, which is one of the best conferences in Division Three, mostly because they have Mount Union, which has won 11 national titles and 23 conference titles since 1986, so it isn't the easiest conference to get a win. Now, even though the Ohio Athletic Conference is a tough conference and has yearly national champion Mount Union in it, like I mentioned, Marietta's awfulness happened before Mount Union's amazing rise. In the 1970s, this team was pretty respectable, as most of the time they finished in the middle of the conference and even won their division in their conference in 1973, as they had a 6-4 and four record. But when they got into the new decade, this team got bad and got bad in a hurry. And one of the reasons for their quick fall was because their longtime coach, Joe McDaniel, left the program before the 1980 season to coach at another school. This left the school scrambling to find a new coach for their team. They found a replacement in Tom Mulligan. I haven't found much on this guy, but I believe he was a high school coach in Illinois before taking this job. Anyway, he came in and actually won his first game, but then the bottom fell out of this team altogether as they lost and lost and lost. They went 0-9 in 1981, 82, and 83. They would eventually fire Mulligan after the 1982 season and was looking for a change as they went to a new coach in Mike Holloway. Except Holloway was a former assistant at Michigan and became head coach at a very young age, so he would suffer through another 0-9 season in 1983. But it was going to get better, don't worry, because in 1984 they would start the season with a few more losses before they finally got to something good. A 3-3 tie, ending their 34-game winless streak before they finally won next week over a fellow bottom feeder in Worcester. The streak was finally over, and over those 41 losses, this team gave up 1,000. 124 points, only scoring 148. So if you want to do the math on that, basically they scored maybe anywhere between three points per game, and they gave up an average of about 35 to 40 points per game. Okay, speaking of bad teams, if you want to hear about the worst, this might be one of the top two or top three worst college football programs of all time. Not just teams, but programs of all time. This is the second school out of Ohio, and this team was once a part of the Ohio Athletic Conference like Marietta, the previous school, but ended up finding another conference in the North Coast Athletic Conference. This school is Oberlin College. They are a small school outside of Cleveland, and like other schools mentioned on this list, they are a top top 100 school in academics in the country, but they do have a minor athletic history too that not many people might know about because John Heisman, yes, the guy the NCAA created the most famous individual trophy for, he coached here in 1892 and 1894, going 11-2-1, and, and actually Oberlin is the last team in Ohio to beat Ohio State. So that is something to also tip their cap to. But since then, this team has been pretty terrible. Uh, they are also credited as being the first, even though I mentioned earlier there was another team that beat them to this, as they hired the first African-American coach in college football in 1972 with the hiring of Cass Jackson. However, this team was the laughingstock for a decade or so, and Oberlin might be the only school besides my worst-rated school on this list to have a worst decade. Oberlin and the 1990s were the worst. Like, the dirt worst. Sports Illustrated and ESPN even mentioned them as the worst college football team in Division Three towards the late 1990s, and they usually never used to cover Division Three. This team was so bad that in the 1990s, they stopped playing in their conference for a year to try to stop the 
the losing streak, but that didn't really work. The only fortunate thing for this team is that they didn't set the losing streak record, but they do have two losing streaks of 40 games or more during this decade. And because of how bad this team was for so long, I'm not going to be covering every team, but focus on two really bad seasons. So first, let's go to 1994. Oberlin were coming into the season off of an 0-10 1993 year, giving them the most losses they had in over 10 years, and two wins through the first four years in the 1990s. Plus, they were coming into the season with a new coach in Pete Peterson, who I couldn't find any info on besides the fact that his name can trip you up and he would be the longest tenured coach of the 1990s at this school. The 1994 season for Oberlin was exceptionally awful, as they normally had anywhere between 18 and 30 players dressed for every game, meaning that if there were any injuries, they had to forfeit games, which actually happened in 1992, deflating their terrible defensive point per game total, but also because this, linemen had to play offense and defense for 60 minutes, which at any division is really tough. Oberlin would go, you guessed it, 0-9 in 1994. But Oberlin this year had some disgusting stats, like in a bad way. So get ready. You might want to wash your hands or your face or your whole body after this. They were outscored this season 358 to 10. This team scored 10 points all season. That's 10 points through nine games. And all 10 points weren't scored on offense this year either, as there was a field goal as well as a 99-yard fumble return this season. So yeah, the offense didn't even score points this year. This team was routinely beaten by four touchdowns or more by halftime, and their worst loss this year was an 83 to nothing loss to the conference champion this season. But here's another bad stat. They set the record and hold it, and it will probably never be broken in this conference either or in Division Three for the fewest yards in a game with minus 22. That's right. This team actually set a record. They have minus minus 22 yards total in a game. Yeah, this team was terrible, and I don't think I've ever found a team besides a team from maybe before the 1900s where an offense didn't score a point at all. They would continue to be terrible as in 1995 and 96, they went 0-10 before the losing streak of 40 plus or more finally ended in 1997 with their first game. But 1998 was a return to their usual dismal state as they went 0-10, getting shut out four times, including losing 71 to nothing again to the conference champion. And they routinely lost by 50 points or more to pretty much everyone uh, who was at the top of their conference. But let's go to another bad year of this team, 1999. It started Oberlin with hiring a new coach after their previous coach, Pete Peterson, was let go after five seasons of going 1-48. and 48. This team would eventually hire Jeff Ramsey, who was walking into a program that was basically hit by a tornado for the last decade, and he really had to clean this up. Plus, Oberlin College was so bad during the 1990s, I mentioned this before, they wouldn't play a full conference schedule, as some of the better teams in their conference weren't wanting to play a team that really wasn't on their level and was a glorified JV high school football team. Oberlin did have a majority of the schedule from teams in their conference, but they did schedule a few teams to hopefully get them a win, including their first game against Swarthmore College, who was going through a long losing streak as well of two seasons or more, and this game was going to help one of them get a win, hopefully. Well, guess what? Oberlin was the team that didn't win, as they lost 42 to nothing to Swarthmore, who lost the rest of the games this year, and Swarthmore would eventually shut down their program next year, so that shows how bad Oberlin was this year. And Oberlin couldn't buy a win this year either, as their closest win they had was when they lost 29-27 to to Earlham College, who finished with two wins this season, and don't worry, you'll be hearing a lot more about them coming up. Oberlin did score 71 points this season, but 27 of them were in that one game that I previously mentioned. They, however, gave up tons of points to the tune of 52 points per game, 526 points total in that season. They also set some records that I have checked and still can't believe it, but they lost 47 to nothing to Ohio Wesleyan. They had the fewest rushing yards ever in minus 70 in a game. They had minus 70. Did they just kneel on every down or punt? But I don't know how you get minus 70 total yards in a game. That's just incredible. Also, their losing was so crazy. It's hard to find a really bad loss, but I would have to say that their most demoralizing loss was 
was their seventh game of the season as they traveled to play Kenyon College. Kenyon were like Oberlin as they were 0-6 coming into this game, only scoring seven points per game, but apparently all you needed to do was play Oberlin because Kenyon's offense was amazing this game as they scored 42 points, matching the amount of points they scored the previous six games, and they beat Oberlin 42-7. Kenyon would eventually go to lose the rest of their games and finish their season 1-9. and nine. So good thing they played Oberlin. Oberlin would lose by an average of 38 points per game. They gave up 42 points in 9 games and a stretch of 3 games where they gave up 199 points or an average of 65 points per game. During the 1990s, Oberlin was 3-95, and 95, which is insane. They would eventually start to be a competent college football team under coach Ramsey as he would coach Oberlin for 15 seasons all the way up till 2013, including coaching Oberlin to three seasons where they finished five and five. And they even finished third in their conference in 2007, which was their highest finish ever. Okay, and finally, I'm going to be ending this marathon of stink and I'll bring you the team that I think is the worst division three team ever. And it is hard to be very bad. And I know you are thinking, well, you just found four really terrible teams. But this team is so bad that they ended their football program a few years ago because they set the record for futility. This is the worst Division Three football team ever. It's the Earlham Quakers of Earlham College. Earlham is one of the smallest colleges in Division Three, with 938 students, and their stadium holds more people than their college currently houses, and unfortunately, not a lot of people went to the games. But now this team went to Division Three, and they founded the North Coast Athletic Conference, which you heard about earlier in the mid-1980s. Earlham was near the bottom of the standings for most of their time, but due to Oberlin being so undermanned and just so terrible and just not good, Earlham was always able to score a win against them, so they never had a winless season while they were in the NCAC. Unfortunately for Earlham, they didn't stay in that conference because in 2010, they moved to the Heartland College Athletic Conference. Conference. This move would lead Earlham to have their worst decade ever. They started their run in this new conference with an 0-10 record in 2010, averaging 11 points per game and giving up 42 points per game. They wouldn't get any better the next year, as they pretty much did the same with an 0-10 record. This time, they scored less points, only scoring 7 points per game and giving up 5 touchdowns or more per game. So this defense is getting a little better, I guess. Uh, it would get better in 2012 as they hired a new coach and their 26 game losing streak to start their decade ended in their seventh game as they held off the 0-7 Anderson College to finally win 21-19 after Anderson missed a two-point conversion in the final minute to tie it. Earlham should have ended their year here because they lost their next game and also lost players along the way because they didn't have enough players to field the team in their final game so they had to forfeit it one to nothing which really messed up their points per game average this year. In 2013, Earlham got a little bit better as they went 2-8, and eight, winning a one-point game over Anderson College, the bottom dwellers of their conference, and Earlham got their best win of this decade as they defeated Kenyon College, who you heard about earlier, who won four games this year. 2014 was going to be better for them, right? No, it wasn't, and this was actually the start of their real darkness and gloom, as their 2014 season ended 0-10, and, and this was probably their best 0-10 season since they averaged 17 points per game and routinely scored 20 points with their defense giving up 45 points per game. 2015 was where you could see the floor starting to cave in for this team, though. They hired a new coach this season, too, as their former player, Nick Johnson, became coach. They scored a lot of points this season, too, with average averaging double digits again, but their defense was so horrendous. Their defense almost beat the record for worst defense, which I mentioned before on this list, as Earlham gave up an average of 58 points per game. There is one game this season where they didn't give up 50 points or more, as they lost 35-34 to to fellow bottom feeder Hanover College. Their defense routinely gave up 10 yards or more per play per game, and most of the teams that Earlham beat were up by four touchdowns or more at half. Okay, so now we are really in the mud with this team. They're really bad, and we're going to get to some really bad Earlham teams right now that you're going to be like, how are they this bad? So let's go to 2016 
was where they were so bad, they went to like embarrassingly bad to where like everyone in the conference knew it. I say this because their defense overall this season may look like they got a little bit better, but it was only because they're out of conference games. They started the season with two out of conference games, and it doesn't matter who, because all you need to know is they lost by a combined score of 58 to 18. So not so bad. Then they had to play their conference games against Anderson College, which was second to last in the conference this year, and they lost 31 to 14. So their defense was only giving up an average of 30 points per game, which isn't that bad. But this is usually the time in their season where players got hurt or players left, making players do double duty, which at any level isn't easy like I mentioned before. This got really noticeable in their next game against Defiance College. Now Defiance's team was a middle of the road team in the conference, and this year they scored an average of 20 points per game, but by looking at the box score of this game, you can tell that Earlham players were tired as they lost to Defiance and gave up 59 points in the process which was one quarter of the total team points scored for Defiance that year. 59 points was also significant for them because they averaged giving up 59 points to each team the rest of the season, including three games where they gave up 60 points or more and a 70-plus point game, never coming within 30 points any of those games. Their record now sits at 33 straight losses. All right, so now we're in 2017, and this season started with the same coach, and it actually got a little bit better. No, I swear, it, it had to be better than 2016. They were 0-10 again, and they were actually in a few games, I guess? They actually held a two-touchdown lead into halftime and a three-point lead into the fourth quarter this year against fellow bottom feeder Anderson College, who I've mentioned a lot on this list, but yeah, they don't make the worst college teams. Uh, they eventually lost to Anderson, as Anderson scored two touchdowns in the fourth quarter to beat him by 11, but still, that is an accomplishment, as I didn't find Earlham having a lead in the fourth quarter since their losing streak started. That was the closest game that they had this season, as they lost by an average of 30 points the rest of the season, including ending the year with a glorious loss, where they were down 62 to nothing at half. Yeah, at half. They eventually lost 83 to 14 to the Rose Holman Fighting Engineers, the champions of the conference this year, so now their losing streak is now at 43 straight losses. Okay, we're almost done with this team, I swear, because the 2018 season was just wrong for them. They started this season against Willing against Wilmington College in Ohio, who were like Earlham because they were so bad the previous years. They had five winless seasons in the 2010s, but they had won two games the previous year and scheduled this game with Earlham because they were looking for a team on their level to hopefully get a win. Well, Wilmington did get a win as they won 49-7 to after taking a 42 to nothing lead into the half and that was Earlham's first shot for a win but it took a while before they got another shot as they continued to lose badly averaging giving up 56 points per game and losing by at least six touchdowns including an 83 to 17 loss to co-champ this season Hanover College their next and last closest win was their ninth game as they played the 1-8 and eight, or 0 wins in the conference Defiance College and Earlham got on them early as on their first drive of the game they won an 11 play drive to take a 3 nothing lead. So could this be? Could they finally win? No, it wasn't as Defiance took until midway through the second quarter to take the lead and they didn't give it up as Defiance won their first conference game, second overall that year, 28-10 to as Earlham slogged through the the rest of their season and their last game was like the last game from the previous season as they lost 70 to 6 and they ended this year 0 and 10 and their losing streak was at 50 three straight losses, setting a Division three record with five straight winless seasons. Their coach would eventually resign to take care of his ill wife, so there is some more sad news for them. And then a few weeks later, the college said that they were going to suspend playing football in 2019 and potentially come back in 2020, but with COVID-19 and Division three being delayed, it probably won't happen. So unfortunately, this list had to end on a somber note, but there you go. There are the worst Division three football teams or the worst college football teams you may have never heard of. If you like this list, please give me a like, share, also subscribe to the channel. Make sure you follow me on Twitter as well at Wronged Sports, and make sure you keep checking out the channel because I'm going to be putting out at least two videos every week for the rest of the year, so I will have more bad teams list. I'm also going to be having some good teams lists, so don't worry. I'm going to be getting to good coming up soon. Thank you so much, and thanks for hanging out with Wrong Sports.